honor and joy to be here this morning. And uh, I love Victor. And um, like you said, they're even from Criswell, and then we serve together at the Dallas Baptist Association. And so uh, I'm truly honored and humble and blessed to be here. And thank you for the invitation, uh, Victor. But uh, Victor got to take his suit jacket off this morning, so I get to take mine off, right? I'm going to take this off if you don't mind. And uh, as you are getting ready, why don't you turn to John chapter 1. So if you have a Bible, turn to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. And as you're turning there, I want to tell you a little bit about my primary ministry, my first ministry, and my most important ministry, and that is my family. I am married. Uh, my wife's name is Casey, and we just celebrated our 10-year wedding anniversary last week. So we've been married for 10 years. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, give her a hand for that. <laughs> and then uh, we have three kids. Our oldest is our daughter, Reagan. She is eight and in third grade. She has red hair. So uh, that's a prayer request. All right. And then uh, our middle is Harper. She is our daughter. She is three. And that is an absolute prayer request. And then our youngest is our son, Titus. And he is 19 months old. And we adopted Titus from Uganda, Africa. And so that is our family, and that's my primary ministry. And so that's a little bit about me. But this morning, I'm here to talk to you about the most important one of all, and that's Jesus. Can we talk about Jesus this morning? Yeah. Are you all okay with that? Yeah. Now, I like to get a little excited, and uh, I, I like to encourage excitement. And I tell our church, um, and I make a deal with our church every Sunday, is uh, if you hear something you like, say amen. Praise the Lord, or hallelujah, and I'll make a deal with you. For every amen or praise the Lord I hear, I'll take 30 seconds off the sermon. Sound good? <laughs> you good with that? All right. Yeah, all right. <laughs> so today we're going to talk about, uh, just like what this slide says, that something good came come from Nazareth. And then kind of the overarching thing we're going to talk about today is Jesus is better. Can we talk about that today? Real simple. Jesus is better. And I don't know about you, but I am not the brightest crayon in the box. And so we're going to keep it real simple today. Jesus is better. Well, what is he better than? Jesus is better than anything. He's better than anything the world has to offer. He is better than money, popularity, prestige, a job. He is better than what the president can give you. He's better than what the world can give you. Uh, we live in Dallas, and we have the Dallas Cowboys. Jesus is better than Tony Romo. Amen? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we have the Cowboys, and they lose all the time, but Jesus always wins. Amen? Yeah. Jesus yeah. is better. Jesus is better than anything the world has to offer me. He is better than any athlete, better than any entertainer. He is better than any musician. He is better than any actor. Jesus is better than Justin Bieber. Right? Amen. Jesus. So Jesus is the only one worthy of our worship. When we sing, we sing to Jesus. When we hear preaching, it better be about Jesus. When we talk, let's talk about Jesus. Sound good? Amen. Amen. All right, here we go. John chapter 1, and let's start in verse 43. All right, John chapter 1, verse 43. John chapter 1 is right before John chapter 2. Does that help anybody? <laughs> All right, John chapter 1, verse 43. And if you're at John chapter 1, verse 43, say, uh-huh. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Jesus is better. Go ahead, say it. Jesus All right, here we go. It says this in verse 43. It says, the next day, Jesus. Turn to your neighbor and say, that's Jesus. That's Jesus. All right, say, look, you got some soul. We're in church this morning. That's Jesus. That's Jesus. All right, the next Jesus decided to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, follow me. So like we just heard the dear lady uh, teach the children about the invitation to follow him to the disciples. Here's two disciples or a disciple here in Philip that Jesus finds, and Jesus says two very important words, follow me. So what he's saying is this is an invitation. This is an invitation for you to know me to experience me, to have me, and I will change your life. Verse 44. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. 
Verse 45. Philip found Nathaniel. You know what I love about this church? Is that Philip meets Jesus, and the first thing that Philip does is go and tell someone else about Jesus. Isn't that good? He meets Jesus. His life is changed by Jesus. He has faith in Jesus. He realizes for himself that Jesus is better. And the first thing he wants to do is go tell his friend about Jesus. How many of you have friends? How many of you have family? How many of you know someone who doesn't know Jesus? Whose job is it to tell them about Jesus? Ours, right? And here's the deal, churches. We talk about what we're excited about, don't we? If we're excited about our job, we talk about our job. If we're excited about a TV show, we talk about the TV show. If we're excited about a sport, we talk about the sport. If we're excited about the song, we talk about a song. And I ask ourselves all the time, I ask myself, and I ask my friends, and I ask our church, if we're saying that we're so excited about Jesus, how come we never talk about it? Right? So God has put people in our life to love and to serve and to tell them about who? Jesus. Jesus. So here's Philip, and he finds Nathaniel. Listen to what he says. He goes, and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth. And I love what he says. He goes, we have found him, Jesus, of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote about. What he's saying here, church, is he goes, the Old Testament. I want you to think about the Old Testament in your Bible. There's 39 books, Genesis through Malachi. And he says, those books, those scrolls, all pointed to a Savior, all pointed to a promised land, all pointed to a Messiah, all pointed to a rescuer, and we have found him, and his name is Jesus. So I want you to think about that. He said the writing of Moses. Well, we know that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, and it was known as the Torah. Turn to your neighbor and say Torah. Torah. All right? What were the first five books of the Bible? Genesis. What are they? The point of all of those books were to teach us about God and point us to a coming Savior. And then he says the rest of the prophets. So the rest of the Old Testament. The point of the Old Testament was to point to the coming of Jesus. It was to say, here's what's coming. Here's what to look for. And what's sad is the religious people of the day who had those scrolls memorized missed Jesus. It says all pointed to Jesus. And he says, we found him of whom the Old Testament is pointing to. His name is Jesus, and he's from Nazareth. And he's the son of Joseph. Look at verse 46. Nathaniel here has an immediate opinion about Jesus. Look what he says. Nathaniel said to him, Can anything good come out of, what does your Bible say, church? Yeah. Nazareth? Now, why is he saying that? Because Nathaniel has an opinion about Nazareth. He doesn't like the town Nazareth. And if you go back 2,000 years ago, the town Nazareth is a, it's a small town. It's a, it's a poor town. It's a town because of finances would take in Roman soldiers and would feed them and clothe them and give them a place to sleep so that they could make money. And the Jewish people looked at Nazareth and thought they were traitors and they couldn't stand Nazareth. And so this is what the Daniel says. I don't like Nazareth. And if Jesus is from Nazareth, then no way can Jesus be the Savior. Right here, Nathaniel has a very strong opinion about Jesus. Did you know that our culture has a very strong opinion about Jesus? All throughout history, people have had opinions about Jesus. For example, one man said this, I believe Jesus was a good moral man, but I do not believe he was the son of God. You know who said that? Benjamin Franklin. You ever heard of Benjamin Franklin? Yeah. Someone else said this. I believe Jesus was a great teacher sent from God, but I don't believe he was the son of God. Gandhi said that. You ever heard of Gandhi? Someone else said this. Jesus is not the only way to God. In fact, there are many diverse paths that all lead to the same spot God. In fact, it's very arrogant for Christians to believe 
believe that Jesus is the only way to God. You know who said that? Oprah Winfrey. You ever heard of Oprah? There's a lot of opinions about Jesus, but hear me very clearly, church. If you hear anything, hear this. Our opinions and culture's opinions about Jesus does not change who he is. Amen. He is God. He is the Savior. He is the Messiah. He is the Rescuer. He is the Son of God. And he is the only way to heaven. Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth, the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus also said this in Matthew 12, 30. You're either with me or you're what? You know the rest of that? Against me. Jesus was very clear. So listen, our opinion about Jesus does not change who he is. The Bible said he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. However, although our opinions does not change who he is, watch this. Our faith in him will absolutely change who we are, right? And I love this. If you ever noticed the bigger view of Jesus that you have, the greater your faith is. But the smaller view you have of Jesus, the smaller your faith is. Has there ever been times where you've gone through difficult days? Anybody had some difficult days? Anybody had bad days before? In those bad days, don't we forget how big Jesus is? And we start struggling with our faith. But then there's good days. Anybody had good days? And often in those good days, we remember how great God is. We say that God is the famous one, right? We remember how great God is. We remember how big he is. And in those moments, we have big faith because we trust in a big God. Let us not forget how big Jesus is. Amen. Amen. And I love what Nathaniel says, or I love what Philip says in Nathaniel. Look at verse 46 again. And so this is what Nathaniel said to him. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And I love Philip's response. Philip said to him, come and what? See, I love it. He goes, hey, don't take my word for it. You have an opinion about him. Come and experience Jesus for yourself. Come know Jesus for yourself. And that is my hope for you this morning, church, is don't trust Shane's words. Don't trust my words. Don't trust Victor's words about Jesus. Our greatest prayer is that you would experience Jesus for yourself. Amen? Yeah. Not that you're just experienced by Jesus. You experience Jesus for yourself. Because that's what it's all about, having a relationship with Jesus. And for you to decide for yourself that Jesus is truly better for you. And you experience that for yourself. Don't take my word for it. Experience for yourself. Come and see and realize that Jesus is God and Jesus is better. Because that's what being a Christian is about. Does coming to a church building make you a Christian? No. All the time, church, I'll ask people, I'll say, are you a Christian? And they'll say, yes, I am. And I'll go, well, how do you know? And they'll go, well, I go to such and such church. Usually what they mean is I go to some building with a steeple on top or a cross on the side. But let me ask you, church, does sitting inside of this building make you a Christian? No. Just like sitting inside of McDonald's isn't going to make you a happy meal, right? <laughs> we understand that. So sitting inside of a church doesn't make you a Christian. What makes you a Christian is you turn from your way of doing things, that's repentance, and placing faith, trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Amen? Amen. He said, come and see. Come and see for yourself. Look at verse 47. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said to him, so here's Jesus, and Jesus is going to show off as the Son of God right here. He says, behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. So Jesus looks at Nathanael and goes, I know you. I can see into your heart. I know what kind of man you are. Look at verse 48. This kind of blows Nathaniel's mind. Nathaniel's really confused here. Listen to what Nathaniel says. Nathaniel said to him, how do you, what does it say, church? Know me. How do you know me? So I imagine Nathaniel's looking at Jesus and going, hey, we've never met before. You don't know me. We didn't go to school together. We didn't play Little League together. We didn't, we didn't sit in Sunday school together. You don't know me. And here's Jesus going to show off. As God. He says, how do you know me? Look at what happens in verse 48. Jesus answered him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Wow. 
So, Nathaniel, so Jesus looks at Nathaniel and goes, yeah, your name's Nathaniel. And Nathaniel's like, what? He goes, you're an Israelite. And I can peer into your heart. I know what kind of man you are. I know what kind of character you are. And Nathaniel's confused. He says, you don't know me. How do you know me? And, then, and Jesus goes, oh, yeah, uh, before you came, I know you were sitting under a fig tree. And that Philip came to you while you were sitting under a fig tree. And this just blows Nathaniel's mind. Remember, just moments ago, he says this. If Jesus is from Nazareth, then no way can he be the promised one. No way can he be good. Because nothing good comes from Nazareth. Jesus just shows off as God. And watch what happens in verse 49. I love verse 49. Because you're going to see Nathaniel's attitude change. And he's going to move from an opinion to now faith. Look at Nathaniel. Nathaniel answered him and said, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are, what does your Bible say, church? The king of Israel. What? <laughs> Just moments ago, he says, nothing good can come from Nazareth. And now he's saying, you are God. And you are king. And I love Jesus' response here because Jesus is going to be borderline sarcastic with him. Do we have any sarcastic people in the room? Anybody get a little sarcastic? Hey, you're pointing at each other. Don't point at each other, right? Anybody get a little sarcastic? I do. Look, Jesus is going to be sarcastic here, and I love it. Look at verse 50. If you're still with me, say, uh-huh. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Jesus is better. Jesus. All right, look at this. Look at verse 50. Jesus answered him and said, Because I said to you, I saw you under a fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. It's almost like Jesus is saying, really? <laughs> That's all it took? Because while ago he said, nothing good could come from Nazareth. And now I said, now I tell you, I saw you sitting under some fig tree. And now you're calling me God and the king. And it's almost like this. Jesus is saying, bro, really? <laughs> you know, we say dude a lot here in Texas, right? Dude, that's all it took? And it's almost as Jesus is saying, you will see greater things than these. I mean, we live in Texas, right? And in Texas, we butcher the English language, don't we? Yeah. yeah? And in Texas, we use double negatives all the time. And so it's almost like if we said this verse in Texas, it'd be like this. Dude, you ain't seen nothing yet. Amen. Amen. I want you to think about that. Jesus is looking at him and saying, wow, I changed your mind by a fig tree. You haven't seen nothing yet. Look at verse 51. And he, Jesus, said to him, Nathaniel, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Jesus looks at Nathaniel and says, hey, follow me. Roll with me, because you ain't seen nothing yet. I am the God of angel armies. I am the king of the world. I am the king of kings. And I want you to think about all of the great kings in history. King Henry VIII, or King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, or the, or the king of rock, Elvis, or the king of pop, Michael Jackson, or the, or the Burger King, whoever, right? Church, and I'm almost done. He says, roll with me. Because you ain't seen nothing yet. He says, Nathaniel, you're going to see me cause the blind to see. You're going to see me cause the deaf to hear. You're going to see me cause those who have never spoken a word to sing praises unto God. You're going to see those who have never walked before stand up and start running. Nathaniel, Roll with me, because you ain't seen nothing yet. You're going to see me walk on water. You're going to see me feed 5,000 with two fish sandwiches. Listen, Subway has nothing on Jesus, amen? <laughs> You're going to see me calm the storm, but you still ain't seen nothing yet. The day where you're going to see me teach the Word of God like no one has ever taught it before, because I am the Word of God, but you still ain't seen nothing yet. 
Nathaniel, you're going to see me raise Lazarus from the dead by my words, but you still ain't seen nothing yet. Nathaniel, you're going to see me live the perfect, sin-free life that you couldn't live for 33 years. But Nathaniel, you still ain't seen nothing yet. Because at 33 years old, I'm going to hang on a cross, taking your place, paying for your sin. But Nathaniel, you still ain't seen nothing yet. Because they're going to take my lifeless body off the cross, and they're going to put it in a borrowed grave. Why is it going to be a borrowed grave? Because they ain't going to stay there too long. Amen? And he goes, that's going to be Friday, the first day, and I'm going to be there. But Nathaniel, you still ain't seen nothing yet. Because Saturday's going to come, the second day, I'm still going to be in the grave. But Nathaniel, you still ain't seen nothing yet. Because Sunday, the third day, I'm going to do a cry kick right out of the grave, baby. And I'm going to show that I have the sin, death, and Satan. And I'm going to show that God the Father has accepted my sacrifice on your behalf through the power of the resurrection. Nathaniel, you ain't seen nothing yet. Because I'm going to show myself for 40 days, proving that I literally, physically overcame the grave. You know what I love about the Gospels? It says on two different occasions, after Jesus overcame the grave, he cooked breakfast for the disciples. And the question I had was, how good were those eggs? Amen? <laughs> the resurrected Jesus cooked those scrambled eggs. You're like, this is better than I hop. <laughs> Right? And he goes, the day you ain't seen nothing yet. Because at the end of 40 days, I'm going to climb on top of a mountain called Olive. And right before your eyes, I'm going to ascend into heaven. And I'm going to go through the gates of pearl, down the streets of gold, through the singing angels and the valley elders. And I'm going to sit down on the throne. And I'm not going to sit down because I'm tired. I'm not going to sit down because I'm famished. I'm not going to sit down because I need a Starbucks break. I'm going to sit down because three words I said on the cross are very important. It is what, church? Yes. And I'm going to sit down as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But guess what, Nathaniel? You still ain't seen nothing yet. Because one day, church, the trumpet's going to blast, the angels are going to shout, and Jesus is coming back for his church. Do you believe that? Yes. And people ask all the time, Pastor, when is Jesus coming back? I don't know. But one thing I do know, church, is today is a heck of a lot closer than yesterday was. Amen? Because the day, you ain't seen nothing yet. Because here's the beautiful thing about the book of Acts in Acts chapter 2 is that Jesus looked at his disciples before he left and he said, I will not leave you as orphans. And in John 14, Jesus talks about a helper, a comforter coming. Who is he talking about? The Holy What Church? Spirit. And all through the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come upon people, anoint people for special occasions, and then leave. The Holy Spirit would come upon people, they would sin, and leave. Right? David said that after his sin with Bathsheba. He says, God, don't take your spirit from me. But here's what's beautiful about the new promise and the new covenant. Is that when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, we turn from our sin, place our faith in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And God sends his Holy Spirit to live not on us, but inside of us. And never to leave again. We get God. Amen. That's the gospel. Yes, our sins are forgiven. Yes, we get to go to heaven. Yes, we get love and joy and peace and all the fruits of the Holy Spirit. But the greatest gift of the gospel is we get God. Amen. We get to know God. We get to behold God. We get to love God. We get to experience God. And we get to have God live inside of us. That's awesome. God gave us his very best, and his very best is himself, Jesus. And just like Jesus told Nathaniel, follow me, know me, experience me, behold me, because I'm better. Do you know Jesus gave that promise to Nathaniel, and he gives that promise to you and me? He's telling you, come, follow me. Because you ain't seen nothing yet. Amen? Yes. Follow me. Follow me. Because Jesus is better. So let me ask you, friend. I'm going to invite Victor to come back up, kind of play, strum on the guitar. I'm going to invite you to take a little journey with me. This is the last thing we're going to do. I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bible to the table of contents. All right? So at the very beginning is your table of contents. 
and there's all the books of the Bible. There's 66 books in our Holy Bible, 39 Old Testament, 27 New Testament, and let me tell you, church, they all point to Jesus, to the truth that Jesus is better. The Word of God all points to Jesus, so let me ask you this, does your life point to Jesus? Is Jesus truly number one in every area of your life? Can you really confess with your words and with your lifestyle that Jesus is better? And if not, can we repent of that this morning? Turn to God. Say, God, I want you. I need you. I want to behold you. I want to accept you as the greatest gift ever. And Jesus, I want to know and experience the truth this morning that you are better. Because all the Bible points to that truth. So I want you to take this journey with me. Follow along in the table of contents. And you're like, well, that's weird. No one's ever had us turn to the table of contents. I'm weird. But Jesus is better, amen? <laughs> I want you to follow along with me. This is who Jesus is in every book of the Bible. 66 of them. 39 Old Testament, 27 New Testament. They all point to Jesus. Look at this. In Genesis, he is the breath of life. In Exodus, the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he's our high priest. In Numbers, the fire by night. In Deuteronomy, he's Moses' voice. In Joshua, he's salvation's choice. In Judges, the lawgiver. In Ruth, the kinsman redeemer. In 1st and 2nd Samuel, he is our trusted prophet. In 1st and 2nd Kings and 1st and 2nd Chronicles, he is sovereign. In Ezra, he is the true and faithful scribe. In Nehemiah, he is the rebuilder of broken walls and lives. In Esther, he is Mordecai's courage. In Job, the timeless redeemer. In Psalms, he is our morning psalm. In Proverbs, he's wisdom's cry. In Ecclesiastes, he's the time and season. In the Song of Solomon, he is the lover's dream. In Isaiah, he is the Prince of Peace. In Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. In Lamentations, he is the cry for Israel. In Ezekiel, he is the call from sin. In Daniel, he is the stranger in the fire. In Hosea, he is forever faithful. In Joel, he is the Spirit's power. In Amos, he is the arms that carry us. In Obadiah, he is the Lord, our Savior. In Jonah, he is the great missionary. In Micah, the promise of peace. In Nahum, he is our strength and our shield. In Habakkuk and Zephaniah, he is pleading for revival. In Haggai, he restores a lost heritage. In Zechariah, he is our fountain. In Malachi, he is the son of righteousness, rising with healing in his wings. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he is God, man, Messiah. In the book of Acts, he is the fire from heaven. In Romans, he is the grace of God. In 1st and 2nd Corinthians, he is the power of love. In Galatians, he is thrill from the curse of sin. In Ephesians, he is our glorious treasure. In Philippians, he is the servant's heart. In Colossians, he is Godhead Trinity. In 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, he is our coming king. In 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus and Philemon, he is our mediator and our faithful pastor. In Hebrews, he's the everlasting covenant. In James, he's the one who heals the sick. In 1st and 2nd Peter, he is our shepherd. In 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John and in Jude, he is the lover coming for his bride. And in Revelation, he is king of kings and lord of lords. He is, he is, he is the prince of peace, the son of man, the lamb of God.
that your Holy Spirit will always remind us, Lord, especially on our trying moments, that you are the only way. You are the only solution. You are the only answer because you are better than anything else in this world. Father, we thank you for that reminder today. And Lord, we thank you for Brother Shay, who shared it to us this morning. I pray that you will bless him and bless the ministry. You trust him to be Lord. And Father, we ask for your blessing upon us throughout this week, Lord. And we will come back here worshiping you again. And may we be mindful, Lord, that we have this responsibility to share you and tell people, come and see who Jesus is. Amen.